Good evening. Welcome to this evening's program. Josiah Bunting III is president of the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation in New York City. Before taking up his duties at the foundation, he served as superintendent of his alma mater, the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia. Among General Bunting's books is a biography written for Arthur Schlesinger's presidential series on Ulysses S. Grant. He is currently completing a biography of George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff during World War II, Secretary of State from 1947 to 49, and Secretary of Defense from 1950 to 1951. He is married to the former Diana Margaret Cunningham. They have four children and four grandchildren. They live on a farm in Fauquier County, Virginia. Please welcome Josiah Bunting. Thank you very much, and uh, <clears throat> I, I'm fighting sort of a bad throat, so I hope you will bear with me a little bit. Before coming down here, I was looking at Fox News. Uh, if you are not on the road that much, and you're staying in a nice uh, motel, you, you tend to watch television. Uh, most of what I saw this afternoon was about the abdominal muscle. Americans have a, a great fixation on abs. Uh, are you like that? <laughs> uh, Sculpt the abs of your dreams, I heard. <laughs> um, Brown University, quote, forbids and will punish any speech that makes someone else feel angry, impotent, <clears throat> disfranchised, or with bruised self-esteem. Another college forbids explicitly elevator eyes. I, and I guess that means if you're looking at a member of the other gender and you look up and down, that's elevator eyes. <laughs> so I thought that would be amusing to uh, people uh, at Hillsdale. This is, a, uh, this is a lovely college, and it's a pleasure to be on a campus like this where people know what their business is, where they seem to like each other, uh, and a place which is obviously flourishing. I had a friend, David Reisman, who was a sociologist who died about 10 years ago. He said the great colleges are places that have a very fierce sense of their own identity, and that what makes the education that is offered by the faculty and the books and the laboratories in those colleges, what makes it stick to the ribs uh, is their consciousness that they are members of an elite, tough, challenging place. And when I heard Dr. Arnn's uh, recital of some of those numbers last night, that is the obviously irrefutable testimony to the success of Hillsdale doing what it believes in and doing it well and making no apologies. Uh, places like this are to be cherished. And there are relatively few of them uh, in the United States. So we are all privileged to be here this evening. I'm going to talk about uh, the classics, <clears throat> but in a way which I hope uh, will not induce uh, sleep too quickly. And I want to talk uh, in particular about the role of classics, and not only classics of history, but other forms of classics in educating young people. A common story. We are members of a small Midwestern church in a town like the town in the movie Hoosiers, which ESPN said is the best sports movie ever made, a town like Hillsdale. A man of 87 has just died, a man born in our town and who, with time out for three years in the Army and four years at the State University, has never left the town. He has raised his children here. He and his wife have been married 54 years. They have 12 grandchildren. He has run the State Farm Agency for 40 years and is quietly active in civic life. He is not a political activist. He is not a pol political hater and is inclined to say of whoever happens to be president, quote, oh, I don't know, that's a heck of a job and he's probably doing the best he can, unquote. That kind of person. His best friend gives the eulogy, and when the friend comes to a brief part in the middle where he says, John served in the army in the Second World War and landed on Normandy, 
on the afternoon of D-Day and was wounded and was awarded the Bronze Star. You suddenly notice many people in the church are suddenly whispering to each other. And what are they saying? I never knew that. You never knew that because he never told you. He did what he was asked to do by his country. What he normally says is, I was in the service. And the last three words of the phrase are assumed, the service of my country. <clears throat> Excuse me. St. Francis is remembered for many things, one of them his observation, that I am always praying and sometimes I even use words. He means that the power of human example is by far the most potent of inspiration and evangelism. Lessons, guides to us, and for an eager, though small, cohort of American students and citizens, the study of our national history furnishes the most fertile source of moral examples, examples of human conduct at its most ignoble and at its most sublime. And this is an important reason that young people should study history, although not the only one. If you have a child, four or five or six years old, who shows signs of early musical interest and aptitude, and you arrange piano lessons for her, be discerning in your selection of her teacher. Ask the teacher what early simple compositions she proposes to use in the little girl's training. The answer you want is Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Schumann. The point is to begin the child's training on simple but exquisite classical compositions by those we call the masters. No pablum. No made up little songs and pieces about birds, animals, and toys in trips to the zoo. The same way in first year Latin in high school. Put simple compositions by good writers and historians in front of your students. No stories written in 2005 called Cornelia in the Kitchen or Farming on My Summer Holiday. And when you introduce your children to history and imaginative literature, do it the way your great-great-grandparents did in the last quarter of the 19th century. Read to them at night in the living room from James Fenimore Cooper, Herman Melville, Francis Parkman, Admiral Morrison, moving along to our own generation from David McCullough's own mentor, Bruce Catton, or from Douglas Southall Freeman. Read them a good life of Churchill or a good life of Lincoln. Read them the last part of General Lee's farewell to the Army of Northern of Virginia. Right after Appomattox, you will take with you the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed. Children need to hear things like that when they are very young, and if you stress them, they learn them, and they subsist on them for a lifetime. Incidentally, that particular sentence, uh, our own time nears, needs to hear that. The satisfaction that proceeds from duty faithfully performed. No Oprah. No Lexus, no People magazine, <clears throat> excuse me, no book contract, just the satisfaction that you did your duty properly. Read them these lines from the greatest political history ever written. Quote, we say a man without political business is a man with no business at all. Or, restraint impresses men most. Or, you have not yet begun to consider what sorts of people are these Athenians whom you may have to fight. The head of every democracy that goes to war, that initiates a war particularly, should think very seriously about those lines. What is the nature of our adversary? These men who love their city and its heritage so much they, they were thereafter ashamed to fall beneath a certain standard. Tell them the story of the citizens of Barrie in England 
B-U-R-Y, Barry. In 1919, the mayor and several other citizens went to Kemal Ataturk, then the president of Turkey, and said, we propose to erect a small monument on the beach at Gallipoli, where many of our sons have died. In the British Army, uh, units that go into combat typically are all from the same place. So that when there is a devastating tactical defeat, the losses are enormous. They saw Ataturk and he said, I would be pleased and proud to permit this, provided you allow me to write their epitaph. Winston Churchill said, magnanimity is the greatest of virtues next to courage, and that is the kind of magnanimity, a story like that, which lodges uh, in the memory of young people, and they can feed off it for the next 70 or 80 years. Having shed their blood here, they have become my sons also. As lineal descendants of Tocqueville's Americans of 1832, very little has changed in our national character. And we shift uneasily in our seats when we hear the word classic. We think of horrible childhood summers when we were made to read boring books from the library with titles like The House of the Seven Gables or The Rise of Silas Lapham. But when I say classic, I mean a human artifact, a work of human creation which is spoken directly and movingly to five or 10 or 30 or 50 generations. When Colin Firth finally recites the King's speech in that wonderful movie, it is inflected with the adagio from Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. And when he leaves the studio to greet his friend, the actor Jeffrey Rush, the director marks the warmth of his reception with the wonderful introductory phrases of the Beethoven Emperor Piano Concerto. These are musical compositions 250 years old, and they are as apt, as exquisite as anything that could be created today, perhaps more so. When Hamlet, wanders about, when Hamlet wonders about the business of an army that he sees in the distance, and it's explained to him that the army is uh, under the command of Fortinbras, a Norwegian. He wonders aloud, <coughs> excuse me, and reflects that he sees in his mind the imminent, imminent deaths of 20,000 men that for a fantasy and a trick of fate go to their graves like beds, fight for a plot which is not tomb enough and continent to hide the slain. They're going off to fight for a place that won't make a cemetery big enough to hold them all. Those kinds of classical metaphors, which lodge themselves in the minds of ardent young students, it seems to me, are a large part of your business. Start them doing it when they are six or eight. Do not wait for them to be exposed, <coughs> excuse me, for ulterior purposes by AP United States History, where they will believe they must learn everything there is to know about Jay's treaty or the establishmentarian flaws in Article II of the Constitution, or if there are hidden signs of racism in the young Abraham Lincoln. Remember seriously the counsel of a famous Renaissance philosopher. Each night upon retiring, require yourself to learn and memorize something exquisite and call yourself to account for it in the morning. It may sound idle to you, but consider this homely but charming anecdote. <clears throat> in 1943, Franklin Roosevelt with his friend Harry Hopkins and the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, are being driven from Washington to what was then called Shangri-La. We now know it as Camp David. Not far from <coughs> Frederick, Maryland, <coughs> again, excuse me, I'm so sorry, they saw a sign marking a small restaurant named for Barbara Fritchie, a Union heroine. Shoot if you must this old gray head, 
but spare your country's flag, she said, looking from her window at the long, ragged gray lines following General Jackson into Maryland. Instantly, Churchill, sitting in the back seat, recited the entire poem, <clears throat> again, excuse me, to all 12 verses. He had done the same thing at the age of 11 when he was a first year schoolboy at Harrow, all of Macaulay's lays of ancient Rome to prove that he was not so dumb as the headmaster might have thought that he was. How can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his father and the temples of his gods? Before you retire this evening, require yourself to reread Lincoln's second inaugural address. The long and infinitely complicated and beautiful penultimate paragraph, a meditation on the question of theodicy. An omnipotent and infinitely good creator has given or has permitted to exist for four years a war of unspeakable horror and suffering. How are we to explain this, Lincoln asks his audience, all of whom know their Bible, as we avow that these judgments of the Lord are true and righteous together. I'm talking about the proper and appropriate furniture for the minds and memories of Americans, beginning when they are young, and when their minds and imaginations are such creations of such creations, passions, classics, as are incarnated in the adults who have learned them and that they see all the time. If you are 50 or 60 years old or thereabouts, plus or minus a few years, and you went to a good college and were made to study the history of our country and not given a choice among 450 so-called distribution requirements, if you were the beneficiary of such good fortune, your text was likely called The Growth of the American Republic. It was written by Henry Steele Commager and Admiral Samuel Eliot Morrison. The section on the revolution and the founding is very powerful. And Commager made a particular study of the period asking the ageless question, how did it happen? that in the last 25 years of the 18th century, in North America, a republic was conceived, brought into being, successfully defended, and established in a way that time has now proved to be the greatest democratic republic or human polity that has ever existed in the world. Why and how was that? Why was that in the spring of 1789, when we were a country of 2.8 million citizens, when the first administration assumed office in New York, it comprised Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, and Henry Knox, Benjamin Franklin still down the road 90 miles away, able to give counsel, Madison the presiding presence in the House of Representatives, Samuel Adams, John Jay, et cetera, et cetera. The historian Commager, accounting for or laboring to account for the, this fluorescence of this kind of talent and accomplishment at this time in our history, offers examples of similar phenomena in other times and places. He talks about fifth century Athens, which then had less than 25,000 citizens. He talked about 18th century Vienna, the venue of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven and their successors, uh, a flock of successors, and interestingly, so many of the great greatest uh, interpreters uh, of those wonderful German composers today uh, seem to be Asians. If you look at the, most of the major symphony orchestras, at least the ones I know in this country, uh, Asian uh, violinists, cellists uh, are, popular, are, are populated uh, all out of proportion, it seems to me, to their percentage of the population. Isn't that an, an odd and beautiful and interesting tribute to what happened in 18th century Vienna? He writes about the Copenhagen of Hans Christian Andersen, the England of Elizabeth, of Marlowe and Shakespeare. We are in the realm of what is called prosopography, the study of different groups of people who come together at a common time for a common purpose. 
But to Commager, <clears throat> excuse me, the most interesting and the most astonishing of these cohorts is that of the American founders. In writing in 1960, during the time of a presidential election campaign, in an essay well, well known, he found himself growing rather bored by conversations he kept bumping into, which asked this question, why were the founders so good and look what we have running for public office today. How can I account for it? Well, Commager, of course, acknowledged the role of chance, being born at the right time, of large challenges that present themselves at infrequent intervals, but unpredictable intervals. We cannot select the year and the circumstances of our own birth. But for the generation of Americans born between 1730 and 1760, and born into circumstances which permitted exposure to schooling, and into homes in which reading and study were valued, and in the colonies along the eastern seaboard, especially Virginia, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> plainly it was in the character of the way they were educated and prepared for their challenges and opportunities that suited them to their tasks. <clears throat> How did they read and study? And with what conscious aims? What were they asked to read? Charles de Gaulle once received a prize as a cadet at Saint Cyr for the proved ability to sit for a long time and study and think about a single thing. Resisting fatigue. On the long New England evenings, they fastened on history, especially that of ancient Rome and Greece, and on history as a teacher of moral lessons to those for whom obligations of citizenship and leadership were primary. They read Plutarch, they read Tacitus, they read Cicero, they read the Stoics. They read about heroes who always exalted the right over the blandishments of fame or riches. John Adams acknowledged only posthumous regard uh, as an appropriate goad or a spur to a proper American citizen. Nothing else could be admitted. Of Washington, Hamilton, Madison, John Jay, George Mason, we might say the same. The study of history and of political philosophy, these were the elements of their education. Great and enormous challenges, but challenges met. These were also people of astonishing versatility. They did it all, and they didn't make much distinction between all of the components of the all. Like the Nike shoe commercial, they just did it. They wrote their own public papers. They wrote far better than we do. They thought more clearly than we. They believed profoundly in emulation. You study Pericles with a conscious aim of getting his qualities into your own character. They prized disinterestedness, that is to say, consciously thinking about things without reference to how they thought might, imp or, or, or without reference to their own prejudices and how they influenced how they thought. They paid only modest attention, interestingly, to their health. David McCullough points out that uh, so many of these revolutionary uh, heroes lived into a advanced old age, like symphony conductors. Think about that a little bit later when, when you leave. They paid only modest attention to their health. Above all, they knew that learning the lessons of history was without full value unless you have the character and the discernment to employ those lessons. Now, this is very important. People talk about the lessons of history. The lessons of history that you imbibe may be wrong, although the better you're educated and the more you think about them, the more likely it is they will be right. But the hard part comes in the implementation of the lesson, the lessons, and that is an altogether different thing. Then it is the brave man chooses while the coward turns aside. 
till the multitude make virtue of the faith they had denied. Uh, that beautiful old poem made into a hymn, by James Russell Lowell, recently thrown out by the authorities of the Episcopal Church as being too warlike. Incidentally, I mentioned uh, 19, 1832. That was an interesting year with regard to the revolution. Dr. Arne mentioned that year last night. That was the year of the death of the only Catholic signer of the Declaration, Charles Carroll of Maryland. Lincoln uh, vividly remembered that and the thrill of horror and grief that swept through the country, and Tocqueville noted it. We had lost physical touch at last with that generation. Americans were very conscious of that at that time. Paul Johnson, a great British historian, extols a successor generation. His generation that he places next to the founders in point of talent and accomplishment was a generation born in the last quarter, <clears throat> excuse me, of the 19th century. For the military and naval great ones of the Second World War, generals and admirals who would be men in their 50s and 60s during that time, the leaders of the great greatest generation. For these people, growing up in those years, a lifetime immersion in history would seem to have been standard. An astonishingly large percentage of these men grew up on farms in the American outback. There has never been a military caste in our country the way there is, for example, in Germany or in Great Britain. But there has always been ambition for improvement, and for many such youngsters, West Point and Annapolis have been their way out of Dodge. Nimitz, Eisenhower, Omar Bradley, contemporaries of Harry Truman's, uh, incidentally, these were all lifetime students of history, and especially of military history, now neglected and even shunned by universities, once at the very heart of the education of people who would serve in wartime very much ignored also in high schools and in graduate schools. If you uh, find pancreatic cancer an unpleasant topic, why not abandon the study of it? If you find war an unpleasant topic, by all means stop looking at it. Invariably, historical narrative and military history separates those who have conducted themselves ignobly from those we used to call heroes. And invariably, our minds are populated with vivid examples, inspiring or incarnated warnings of conduct that is base. A peculiarity of the military profession, for those who make it a career, is that it must be learned for the most, time, most part in peacetime. We cannot know who is going to be an inspired and a gifted military leader until he or nowadays, she is tested in battle. But military history and its study can at least help us in the training and preparation and education of those who would follow that profession. No profession seems to rely less in finding and recognizing talent for leadership than academic success. Uh, if you read biographies of famous soldiers, and Americans uh, love to read those books, even though most universities don't teach them. You walk into Barnes & Noble any Saturday morning and there's a, the rug is worn uh, thin by people running up to get books about <laughs> retired generals, great generals. Um, and one of the things that uh, is so interesting about most of these people, and you can predict this in almost every book, is that in the second chapter, which is usually called boyhood or something like that. There is an opening participial phrase, usually in the second paragraph, although a mediocre student at West Point, comma. <laughs> although a mediocre student at West Point, comma. There are only two exceptions to that. Uh, one was Lee, uh, who was uh, the number two man in his class of 1829, and the other was uh, Doug Douglas MacArthur, uh, who graduated at the head of his class in 1903. The point is not that Ulysses Grant was a dumbbell, 
The point was, frankly, and I taught at West Point for a while, a lot of the bright ones are bored and they don't want to study that stuff. And they look out the window or they read something that has not been assigned. And then suddenly when they're about 35 or 40, bingo, they're number one in their class at Fort Leavenworth and uh, two or three years later, they're commanding a division. The linkage between military success and academic success is very, very frail. Johnson is talking about the generation of Eisenhower, MacArthur, Marshall, Nimitz, Halsey, Spruance. This was a generation, as I said earlier, raised mainly in the outback, not privileged of boyhoods. Eisenhower, of course, classic son of the hard scrabble boyhood, all of them readers of history as young men. And here's the interesting thing. Most of them were born at a time when they were being taught by veterans of the Civil War who were still relatively young people. If, like Douglas MacArthur or George Marshall, you were born in 1880 and you were a 12-year-old school, 12 year old school boy in the early 1890s, uh, you had teachers uh, who were still on the right side of 50 who had fought at Shiloh or Gettysburg. So you had a direct link with the great ones who had participated in that way. They grew up in families in which parents read to them, usually from history at night and from important works of literature and history. President Roosevelt used Eisenhower as a guide when he was shown the ancient battlefield of Carthage near a major North African battle where American soldiers had been fighting the Germans. Marshall performed the same office for others that he escorted. Someone said, how do you know all of this? He said, I read all of G.A. Henty when I was a boy. My parents read, made, made, made me read all of those books. G.A. Henty was a famous writer of uh, military, classical, and medieval works about war. The most popular classical history writer of historical novels of the day, the most famous of which, uh, published uh, in the late 1870s, was Ben-Hur, A Story of the Christ, one of the three bestsellers of the second half of the 19th century. You can probably get uh, Uncle, Tom, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Would you uh, want to go for a trifecta, anybody? The memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant sold more than two million copies. Um, an enormous bestseller. Mark Twain was the, as it were, midwife and publisher. Uh, he profited handsomely from the sale of the book, and they sold it door to door to all veterans of the Union Army. How can you be without the memoirs of the great General Grant? Oh, I certainly can't. Let me get my pen. <laughs> and in 1895, uh, Mark Twain gave Mrs. Grant, Julia, a check for $200,000. And I have no idea what that must have been worth in 1895. The point is that the presumption still held. You read history, especially the histories of war, diplomacy, and politics, of statesmanship, and the early years of the American Republic. And you read with a conscious intent of improving, but to know more and for pleasure, and again, to populate your minds and memories with, war, with men and heroes who have deserved well of the country. In 1947, George Marshall, who was Secretary of State, was sitting on the platform with the president of Princeton University on the occasion of celebrating the 200th anniversary of that university. He remarked to the president, looks like all of the students have been in the army. And of course they were, they were GI Bill graduates. What made Marshall say that, the president asked, he said they're all wearing khaki pants. That's where that started. And you can walk into any men's store in the United States and all 20-year-old boys on their way to college, probably here at Hillsdale, are still wearing khaki pants. That's where that started. The prominent members of Paul Johnson's leaders of the post-war era prominently included, along with Marshall, and this is the second half of Johnson's great cohort, a great son of Michigan, and I earnestly uh, hope that when you hear his name, there will be a yawp of delighted recognition. 
He is one of the great forgotten Americans of the last century, right up there with people like Henry Stimson and Elihu Root, Arthur Vandenberg. I hope he is remembered affectionately in this state and with pride, and particularly in his hometown of Grand Rapids, where he was editor of the paper. He went to Washington. Uh, he became uh, president pro tem of the Senate, head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and working with Harry Truman, formed uh, such a partnership of bipartisanship that was more responsible than anything else, working with Marshall and others, uh, in charting and implementing the most prolific and successful and admirable period in the formation of foreign policy in our national history. 1945 to 1950, extraordinary. The Marshall Plan, NATO, the Western Alliance, the Berlin Airlift, the recognition of Israel. This was a time of enormously prodigal achievement. These men, Marshall in the State Department and others who worked for him 10 or 15 years younger, interesting, interestingly, were all products of a very different form of education, and I'll touch on it briefly because my time is lim limited. But so many of us uh, curl our upper lip if we are Midwesterners or if we live in the South when we hear names like Brown and Columbia and Harvard and Princeton and Williams and those kind of places which are sort of wimpy and uh, excessively liberal and a bad form of liberalism, the kind of liberalism which uh, stands liberalism on its head. John, St John Stuart Mill said, there can be no philosophy where fear of consequences is greater than love of truth. And if you are a young professor making your way on the faculty of one of those places, and you let slip that you like Edmund Burke or Aristotle or perhaps even voted for George Bush, you will not receive tenure. Think about the horror of that. Everything a university should not be is represented in that kind of climate. However, the universities which furnished most of the graduates that worked for Truman at that time were very different until about 1950. They were nurseries of active and aggressive American patriotism. Just walk around the campus of Harvard, look at the chapel at Princeton or at Columbia. These were the first people to join up in 1917. They couldn't wait to serve. And not only to serve, but to go in the, in the dangerous places of the field. Everybody who worked in the Department of State under Marshall, just like everybody who had worked as a civilian in the Department of War under Henry Stimson, had served in World War I. Robert Lovett, who became Deputy Secretary of Defense in 1951, won the Navy Cross flying one of those so-called airplanes in 1917. You were dealing with an entirely different phenomenon in those days. If you were born into American privilege, you owed the country, and you freely and enthusiastic, enthusiastically acknowledged your debt citadels of American patriotism. This is the Princeton of John Witherspoon. It's the Princeton also of Don Rumsfeld, who in 1954 graduated from the university and came back in the year 2004 and told the graduates that in his class, 550 people out of a class of 1,000 had gone into the military. Not for a career, but for two or three years, it was the kind of thing you did, you owed. If you wanted the elective franchise in Colonial Maryland, you had to be in the militia first. Well, there was this also. Speaking uh, at this 200th anniversary, the Secretary of State told the undergraduates that he could not imagine their leaving the university without having studied and carefully reviewed in their minds the long twilight struggle between democratic Athens and authoritarian Sparta. He could not imagine someone leaving without having mastered that great book, The Peloponnesian War. This must have astonished the faculty to hear this person say that and must have confused uh, the, uh, the people about to graduate. He turned aside the old argument <clears throat> 
that the study of history was principally important as instruction in the character of human affairs. Of course it was this, Marshall said, but much more important, it puts fire into the convictions about what is needed and what it is right to do. It puts fire into the convictions. He spoke in the same spirit. Pericles addressed Athenians gathered for the public funeral of citizens killed in the first year of the war against Sparta. Here simply is the sustaining inspiration of classical history. <clears throat> well, does this mean that we are to be and to become historical chauvinists? Citizens who simply appropriate from history whatever suits us, our biases and our prejudices? No, emphatically not. If anything, it should immunize us against the simple-minded embrace of examples we find simply to make points. The troubles of our proud and angry dust, said Hausman, are from eternity and shall not fail. <clears throat> We hope to earn, an American historian wrote 40 years ago, and I think this is a wonderful uh, analogy. We hope to earn a habit of mind, a way of thinking, what Victor Davis Hanson calls sophrosyne, a, a certain poise of thought, a balanced way of looking at things, and intellectual patience that might be compared to the practical wisdom of a general practitioner of medicine who has spent a lifetime watching, listening, judging, testing, observing. The skill of an old country doctor, a diagnostic skill. For after all, if we study history only to satisfy an itch or a curiosity, and with no sense that we will use what we are to learn, we really are not historians at all. We are simply antiquarians. I have the sense that Hillsdale believes these things uh, in its heart. We are so fortunate to be here. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> We'll now open the floor to questions. Well, that seems to have uh, taken care of all the questions. <laughs> At Fort Benning, they say, is there any questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, thank you for your presentation, General. Um, I recently read Education of a General, uh, the biography of Marshall, uh, 18... 80 to 1932, I believe it was. I uh, understand that's one of your projects. Could you uh, tell us how you're going to, um, your, your perspective and, and what you're going to do uh, with that particular work? Yes. Um, I was warned, I, I work in New York City and occasionally I go to dinners, <clears throat> and I was warned that if you ever find yourself acting as an MC <clears throat> and Henry Kissinger is the speaker, don't ever call for questions, because you will be there until quarter of two. And I'm going to try to uh, do this in about 90, 90 seconds. And if my wife were here, she wouldn't even give me 90, 90 seconds. Marshall is an artifact of his own conscious creation starting at about age 15. Very Victorian person. I am going to be a certain way. Uh, he was uh, attracted to the military profession basically through his great uncle, who was one of Lee's aides. And he is one of those people who came along at the right time, but who was uniquely equipped to take advantage of what he had learned. Went to the Philippines when he was very young, got his big break in World War I, served with John Pershing. He had developed a uh, reputation for intellectual rectitude and proficiency, which was astounding. Uh, he was very quiet, he was very calm, he made his way strictly through military efficiency, but every now and then would do something that was so astounding people could not believe it. I'll give you one quick example. September 1917, he's at the First Division headquarters, John Pershing comes down to talk to the officers. 
Pershing has just seen the officers uh, put on a demonstration of a battalion attack against a trench. When the demonstration is over, Pershing turns to the general and all of the officers, and Pershing was a man of a titanic presence. He was the most formidable and scary person you and I have ever met. I am disgusted with what I have seen. I am embarrassed and I am ashamed to be in the same army with you. This is the worst demonstration of its kind I have ever, I have ever seen. Stares at them for a while and then turns to walk away. Just a minute, General Pershing. There's something that needs to be said here. And since nobody else is, I suppose I should. Who are you? Major Marshall, sir, operations officer. For the next five minutes, Marshall lets loose a fusillade of data demonstrating to Pershing why the demonstration has gone awry. The division has marched all night long. They've had no time for rehearsal. They've never been asked, et cetera, et cetera. All of it very compelling evidence. He finishes. Pershing uh, nods and then turns to walk towards his limousine. Marshall lays a hand on the forearm of the great man. It's a horrific thing, all of these officers watching this. I'm not finished. <laughs> and then goes on for another two or three minutes. And Pershing, by this time, who was really nonplussed, uh, says, well, you know, we have a lot of problems at headquarters also. And I understand that all of us have many challenges we have to overcome. And Marshall says, that's true. But we have to finish ours every night before we retire. <laughs> Pershing gets into the limousine, drives away. General Cyber comes, puts his arm around him. Uh, everybody gathers around. Good luck in Guam or Alaska. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Two weeks later, Pershing comes down. And thereafter, whenever he arrives, he has to see Marshall. And within six months, he has made Marshall a chief operations officer uh, of the First Army. And at the end of the war, he asked Marshall uh, to be his aide de camp. So Marshall spends the next five years working directly for Pershing in Washington, basically learning Pershing and the whole army, but also the congressional, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, fast forward uh, just very briefly, and I, I will make this very short. In 1938, he attends a meeting in the Oval Office with President Roosevelt. Uh, there are 13 people present. Uh, the Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Brigadier General, so-and-so. He is by far the most junior officer. He's a brand new brigadier, um, a deputy chief of staff. And Roosevelt uh, says the kind of thing that a lot of Americans were thinking in 1938 when we were descending into something horrible. We weren't certain what it was, but many of us felt that what was coming would not end somehow with our, without our participation. Roosevelt's idea was instantly to uh, order the construction of 10,000 warplanes. That's what they used to be called. We need 10,000 warplanes right away. These warplanes, like a good navy, are inherently defensive, and they will serve as a deterrent. We will not have to worry about uh, Hitler. Of course, at that time, France was, had not fallen. And uh, he finishes. And then he says quietly, uh, everybody agree with that? What about you, General Marshall? What about you, George? What do you have to say? I don't agree with you at all, Mr. President. I think that's a bad idea. Same scene. Everybody leaves. Good luck on Guam, and so on. <laughs> Two days later, uh, Harry Hopkins, who works for Roosevelt, calls Marshall up and says, uh, the president would like to talk to you some more about your views of how these things might be done. And about six months later, this uh, interesting fellow Hopkins, uh, a uh, pretty close to a socialist, very left-wing, uh, bete noir of, of most, most, most of us. But he was very close to Roosevelt. And he said to Roosevelt, war is probably coming. And to run the army, you need this man. And he said something like, you, Franklin, in the way you are, you need someone like this. He is rigid. He is orthodox. He is brilliant. He is austere. 
He is cold. He tells the exact truth. He pulls no punches. But he's as good as, as it gets. Roosevelt reaches over 34 senior generals, makes Marshall head of the army. And Marshall and Roosevelt together for the next five and a half or six years are responsible for selecting uh, the most extraordinary array of talent we have ever had in the American armed forces, including the Civil War. We go to war at the beginning with Mark Clark, Omar Bradley, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Spruance, Nimitz, Halsey, uh, just a galaxy. And Marshall had been watching all these people in the 20s and the 30s when they stayed in uniform and didn't get out to try to make a million bucks. You want to see the definitive uh, gloss on this subject, go see the movie The Cane Mutiny. It's about 40 years old, and there's a scene at the end in which they talk about what, what we're talking about right now. So that was Marshall at his very best. And then he's brought into the State Department, really, uh, at the time when our affection, which was quite serious, 1946 for the Soviet Union, was dissipating. They were no longer a country that had lost 25 million killed and that were our allies. And Life magazine had pictures of a guy named Joe on the cover, picture of Stalin. We, we, we were actually at that point, many of us, not me, not you, but a lot of people. Um, Marshall becomes Secretary of State at a time to restore some order to the State Department. And it inaugurates this extra extraordinarily uh, productive period that I, that I talked about uh, earlier. Very difficult person to get to know. Thank God that people in those days wrote, wrote long letters. I don't, know, I don't know what the historians are going to do uh, 50 years from now. This is where they let it hang out. They wrote long, beautiful, rather tender letters to each other. They, um, just as a last gloss on Marshall in that group, they also had and did not apologize for leisure. There was no cult of visible busyness. They had leisure. They went to school. They taught. They thought about their profession. They thought seriously as early as 1925 that the United States would be involved as a member of a coalition in a war against, uh, against the, what became the Axis powers. Uh, there is one last chapter in Marshall's life, and that was, of course, uh, Korea and the whole MacArthur uh, uh, uproar. And maybe sometime when we have three or four days, we, we can uh, talk about that. I will say this about that relationship. Uh, people impute a rivalry between MacArthur and Marshall. George Marshall did not do rivalry. This was a sort of a Marcus Aurelius type of person. And when at the end of the war, all of these fellows were asked to uh, cash in, right? Write their, write their memoirs. 18 members of the uh, second Bush administration have already written or are writing books about their time. Marshall was offered a million dollars by Bennett Cerf for his memoirs. I have already been adequately compensated by my country. See you later. Now, where has that gone? And besides, if I undertook to do it seriously, I would no doubt give pain to the families of men no longer living, who have deserved well of the country. You know, this is why this uh, greatest generation, but also the leadership cadre of this generation, our kids need to know about that. Um, let me mention one last name to you, uh, Pershing. I don't think uh, most intelligent American high school students have any idea who Pershing was. Uh, we have to keep alive the active memory of these people and populate the memories of our kids with them. You know? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. One? No question? Yes, sir. Thank you, Jennifer, Jennifer, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I wish you would address a little bit MacArthur as well. First of all, his early education, which was also uh, steeped in the classics, but I also remember his spending some time in the West. Yes. And then also addressing what he did at West Point uh, yeah. when he was commandant there. Uh, you know, MacArthur, uh, 
is an extraordinary American, extraordinarily accomplished, extraordinarily complicated. Uh, like Robert E. Lee, who, who made his career as a professional soldier, he then becomes president of a college and is what we would almost call a progressive, liberal, enlightened person when he runs the college. And Douglas MacArthur, as, as uh, essentially the proconsul of Japan, revealed extraordinary talents uh, as a civic leader uh, of a country which was gradually being converted into a functioning democracy. Uh, he was a man of extraordinary ability, there's no question about it. Uh, with the exception of Admiral King, he was easily our best strategist in World War II. King and MacArthur basically conceived the whole strategy which we began to implement at Guadalcanal in 1942, move, moving up New Guinea and all of that. There's no question that there was nobody, uh, nobody could hold a candle to him in the Army in that regard. Uh, as a uh, leader capable of inspiring, fusing together an Army under terrible circumstances and indeed a whole country, he was superb. Uh, he was the best there was. Um, at West Point, his career was very famous. His father had won the Congressional Medal of Honor on Missionary Ridge at the age of 19, so that's pretty good uh, inspiration. Uh, he graduated at the head of his class at West Point. His mother lived in the Thayer Hotel, less than half a mile from the barracks at West Point the whole time he was a cadet, and sort of let it be known that Mrs. MacArthur is around. <laughs> not taking anything away from General MacArthur. Uh, in World War I, his behavior was a little bit like Patton's behavior in World War II. He was a, a daredevil. He was physically extremely and f famously brave, very ambitious. Uh, he ran afoul of Pershing, who was uh, quite orthodox. He wore bizarre costumes when he went into combat. He wore a muffler and uh, took the grommet out of his hat, and that, that kind of thing but uh, by far the best decorated uh, of all of our soldiers in France. Uh, he was a uh, division chief of staff when it ended and a brigade commander. He then went to West Point and uh, determined to shake the institution up and to make people study politics and economics as well as fluid mechanics and calculus. Uh, he worshiped at the great cult of football. The whole time he was uh, on Bataan, he was getting telegrams from Coach Red Blake, his friend. He, he was really into that. So all of those things were to the good. The problem was he uh, was not very good at reading other people who were smart and who had useful things to say that did not agree with his own things. Uh, he suffered uh, the way many generals do from, from what Mar Marshall called localitis. He did not agree with the predominantly European strategy of the Roosevelt administration. He wanted everything sent out to help him. Uh, and at the end, you're faced with or forced uh, to confront a kind of a conundrum. And that is that although his leadership in Korea during the uh, nine months that he was commanding in the Far East, was enlightened and, and brilliant, particularly uh, up through Inchon. No matter if, as a strategist, you are Napoleon Bonaparte or Alexander the Great, you cannot continue to publicly attack and denigrate and disagree with the constituted civil authority of the country. My first boyhood memory is the Truman MacArthur thing, and I was ready to uh, I was ready to join up some kind of an army that would go attack President Truman. That was, a, that was a terrible, fraught time in our history. But as much as you admire MacArthur, uh, the president was correct. And he was supported by all of the Joint Chiefs. We, we just can't have this. So uh, MacArthur, uh, no doubt, among the two or three great ones of the last century, he's, he's, he's right there. Uh, but a, a, a very complicated person. Can I, can I end with one funny story, the story I told you today? He came back to the United States. Uh, there were huge uh, outpourings of, of welcome. Uh, he gave a famous uh, and quite beautiful speech before the, a joint session of Congress. He, was, uh, he went through a long series of Senate hearings with all of the other generals. 
And then he was made uh, chairman of the Boulevard Corporation. Uh, and I think he was handsomely compensated. I don't think he did a lot of work. Uh, one day, his wife, who was much younger than he was, Jean Faircloth, a Tennessean, uh, called her friend up in New York City. They'd just gotten there. And she said, I, I don't know anybody in this city. I'm sort of intimidated by it. Could, could you and I just go to a good restaurant for lunch? I don't even know any restaurants. And the friend said, uh, yes, there's a new Scottish restaurant which is open here. I'm anxious to take you there. McDonald's. <laughs> a, new, a new Scottish rest, restaurant. <laughs> Thank you.